thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, thank you, uh, faculty, for coming here. Some of you who are responsible for me be standing here in front of you, helping me get into the University of Florida. And thank you, everyone else, for, for helping me get to this point, you know, for this journey, uh, six-year-long journey. But my journey actually didn't start here at UF. It started as a midshipman at the Naval Academy. And this time, when I built this, is my senior design project. And I built a remote control bomb diffusing robot. And this is the remote control side. And you actually would stare into the stereoscopic camera. And it was kind of, at the time, improvised explosive devices were killing a lot of Marines and sailors. And so this is kind of my attempt. But I learned a lot about microcontrollers. That was my first project with actually a microcontroller. And when I graduated, I went out to serve in the fleet. And I continued to build projects. Uh, and the next project I did that was significant uh, was to solve a family problem we had with a bird that was too noisy. And so my mom was talking about getting rid of our bird, Pepper. And I said, well, we got to keep him. I'll use my engineering skills and build a squirt gun and have it voice activated. So when he would squeak at it, it would blast him with water. It worked about three weeks, kept him quiet for a while. But then we think he started using his bird bed because he just kept going off all the time. He kept just squeaking. And so um, I said, well, you know, the problem is, is he wants to be in the room with us. He's not in the room with us. So how do I get him to go around the room uh, without without allowing him to walk because he poops every 20 minutes his wings are clipped we have you know we have fans and things like that so i thought well african greys are notoriously very intelligent so maybe if i trained him and built a device that would allow him to drive around that's where the first generation bird buggy came in very rudimentary robot only used a microcontroller and this is kind of the extent of of my ability leaving the navy uh fast forward to when i graduated uh, when i started at uf and i actually revisited this problem built a much more sophisticated robot this is the first time where i learned how to work with linux uh and then lurk, uh, work working with an embedded arm processor i also had the network microcontrollers which is something i've never done before uh and then of course computer vision so we had a camera up there and this was a big success dr schwartz will always hype up how i have a million views on youtube and then after this i, I led the propagator one team uh, and this, this was kind of my first time working with other engineering students and working with mechanical engineers that uh, I learned things such as CAD modeling. I'd never done CAD modeling before this and, and machining. Dr. Cream was gracious enough to allow us to use his equipment. We actually developed some, I developed some of the aluminum structures in the front of that along with the camera casing using Dr. Crane's and my equipment. I uh, also started learning about how controls can be applied to platforms. So this is a much simpler platform than a submersible, which has six degrees of freedom. This one, you only have two on, or three on the surface uh, because you're on a plane. Uh, so I kind of started learning about these things, getting exposed, this getting exposed to computer software. And then I started working with Subjugator 7. This is a much more advanced project uh, that had a much more sophisticated controller. And I also under started learning the difference between waterproofing and water resistant connectors and, and where you would use either and, and how the pros and cons of each. And also about underwater navigation and why it's so difficult. And also about a sensor called a Doppler velocity lock, which acts a lot like a uh, optical mouse that you use on your computer, except instead of using a light or a laser, it actually uses sound. So two years later, uh, in 2014, Malaysian Airlines went down uh, unexpectedly. They, they didn't know where it went down, and the initial search started with uh, aircraft and ships and, and autonomous surface vehicles. But after several weeks, they realized there's just there's no debris, no debris on the surface, and the, and the search continued underwater using these autonomous underwater vehicles. And one of the limiting factors of autonomous underwater vehicles is communicating with them underneath. The bandwidth, when they typically would use what's called an acoustic modem, and uh, and to send data from the submersible to the surface, but it's very very slow. I talked with a uh, bluefin. Uh, uh, engineer and he stated it took about five minutes to get one image from the imaging sonar and if the vehicle was moving several meters per second I calculate it could pass over three lengths of 1777 but in between frames uh, and, and, and it's just terribly slow slower than uh, even 56k modem from the 90s we're talking fastest at 30 30 K so my idea was to take sort of the, the, the strengths and weaknesses of, the, of, of uh, AV operations and using other submersibles to come up with a plan. The idea was that you would have a surface vehicle with a tether, and the tether has zero low latency, very low latency, and you have a remotely operated vehicle that'd be operating at the same depth as the AV submersible that's searching. And then that submersible, that AV would then be able to dock with the ROV and send its data immediately up to the surface vessel. And this cuts back when you're descending and ascending. The engineer also told me it took the submersible two hours to get to the depth where it could start using the uh, imaging sonar. And then it took another two hours for them to recover it where they could charge batteries and get information out. So if we could cut down that uh, by uh, transferring data more uh, often underwater, that would really help 
improve efficiency. Uh, but that has been done already. That, that is not new. What's new, though, is it's never been done with an autonomous surface vehicle. What that does, it gets out the human of the equation, greatly reduces cost. And that's why the co that's the most expensive factor in this, why they killed it, uh, to stop surgery for the Malaysian Airlines. It's just been so expensive to keep you above it. So that was my idea. My intention was to prototype this. And I was going to use three vehicles that we have available in our lab. First one was Subjugator 8. This is a, a, a fully autonomous submersible that we use to compete with. Now, my involvement with this, I'm more of an assistant on this and, and sometimes as an advisor. I was involved uh, with the construction of this. However, there, I did not design anything on it. But I learned a lot about the construction of it and, and how machining uh, goes with aluminum. The next vehicle, that would, and that would be my autonomous underwater vehicle. And the next vehicle we'd use would be a, a Navigator ASV, which was uh, the vehicle we took to Hawaii uh, and competed. And my role in this was as the team leader. Uh, where I led a student team of about 18 students, uh, traveled all over Hawaii and competed in an international competition. Once again, my, my roles were more logistics and, 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 and motivating students and, and, and assisting them with their contributions to the platform. Now, what I did directly contribute was the remotely operated vehicle. So this is Anglerfish, uh, a platform I developed built around a watertight enclosure and 3D printed frame. Uh, and it was a lot of work. First time ever building a submersible by myself. Um, and, uh, and you can see here's one of the typical setups going out to the pool and testing. Just a, a lot of equipment that has to come out. And when you only have one or two people out there, it's a lot of work. So the idea was how I was going to prove this concept of improving autonomous underwater vehicles was we go out to Lake Wabert and uh, deploy Navigator, deploy Anglerfish, deploy Subjugator. And Subjugator would be out and alone on a separate network. And at some point, Anglerfish would begin transmitting. And then uh, subjugator would start, which has a pass sonar, would, would home in on that transmitter, start heading towards it. And when it got close, it would shift from acoustic homing to visual homing, because visual homing is a lot more accurate. Acoustics is great at long range, but acoustic visibility is not as great. So you get higher resolution with visual tracking. It would dock. Information from subjugator would be transferred through anglerfish, through the tether, up to navigator, which would then be transmitted wirelessly to the shore. Uh, and then once that was complete, Subjugator would be released and, and deployed back out into a while to do further uh, research. So my contributions. First one was the idea of improving autonomous underwater vehicles using uh, three autonomous systems. And then my other contribution is the contribution of Anglerfish and a tracking system that could be used to track the submersible. Here are my journal papers. Uh, the most recent one uh, was the design, construction, and implementation of an inexpensive underwater sonar that was submitted last month still pending review, um, and then the rest are, are uh, conference papers that have been published. So we'll start with the construction of Anglerfish. Uh, when I first started Anglerfish, I didn't really know what I was doing or what it would look like. Uh, so this, this was kind of my initial, initial uh, start where I'd have six thrusters and designed it all on the computer and uh, started first with a watertight enclosure through a company called Blue Robotics. And inside of here, we have a bunch of uh, a switch and a, a, a computer. And one of the things that I really liked why I went with Blue Robotics is because they have these very affordable thrusters that have an electronic speed controller inside. This is what it looks like. So an electronic speed controller is basically the computer that drives the motor. So you can't drive a motor directly with a computer. You need to have some sort of interface. And they put this right inside of the thruster and it's a complete package. Another benefit of that is you can uniquely address each thruster. So all, all six thrusters were on the same network. So I only needed one cable to talk to all uh, six thrusters. And this is what the layout looked like with a power and communication where I had a LiPo battery that came into a simple power splitter that then had seven outputs uh, six of those went to the thrusters, then went to, one went to the in water tank closure of the power of the electronics. And I had one cable that came out uh, on I2C that communicated to the six thrusters. It was great on paper. It was fantastic. Uh, really happy with it. And they're very affordable. Uh, and so I started developing uh, the uh, power distributor. You can see it's simply a, a perf board with some cables coming out. Now, now, I did build around it a skeleton, a frame, strain relief. So if you accidentally yank on one of these cables, you actually yank on the on the hardware right there and you're not yanking on the solder and this is the process what potting process uh, for the community uh, connection uh, for communication I squared C in the finished product and this is going to be mounted on Anglerfish and I actually conformed uh, the, the power bricks and the communication bricks so they kind of they, they made it really well uh, with that and I could build my frame around it uh, so it, it came together nice nicely and, and had a lot of friction so it wouldn't slide around uh, and then at this point so, so great I got I got the thrusters mounted uh, they look good. Let's, let's put watertight uh, connectors on it. And I'd never done this before. I'd never done potting or anything like this. This is really my first time to do it. So 
I, I really did overkill with, with it because we had, uh, had some horror stories where some students had not used enough potting. And so I really nuked it this time. Uh, but you can kind of see the inside. But as I progress, the, you'll see that the potting gets a lot more efficient. You can see on the table here, I have some late stage potting and it's much, much smaller. And those are just as effective as the, as the huge football ones I made. Uh, so with everything watertight proof, I took the electronics out. So let's do a leak test, put it in about three, three feet below the water, quick test and failure. It leaked through the connectors. And this, this plagued me, uh, this is the weakest link. This plagued me for several months trying to hammer this out, agitating the cables with brake seals and stuff like that. So actually, you'll see in the later design, I actually have all the cables restrained so that when you flex them, they don't flex it. The entrances, they flex later on. Uh, so now with the water tank closure solved, it's not leaking anymore. I now want to allow the submersible to interface with the world. So I came up with an actuator board. Uh, it, it consisted around six MOSFETs, so it's a simple on-off. I can turn on the light, turn off the light. That's basically what it allows me to do. This one was a little bit trickier. You can see the, the, the strain relief on it. It was trickier because the MOSFETs were higher, so I had to come up with a more complex mold that went into it, sandwich it. Uh, but it still also came out really well, conformed to it. And then a little oversight, the uh, cables were a little short, so I had to extend them, of course, pot those extended cables. On uh, the next set, you can see the uh, LED that I used, uh, intended on using for tracking. So with that done, with the electronics and the actuators mounted, I said, okay, it's time for, let's do a lake test. The boat was going out this weekend, so let's just see what happens when I put it in the water. Uh, and you can see there's a camera in the front of the dome uh, that, that was used to look in the water, and I'll use that to track sub, or subjugator when we do docking for, for recording purposes. Uh, but this is, this is the image of what it looks like, a uh, screenshot from Lake Wabur, kind of foreshadowing that big green block, that's what the water looks like. So this is foreshadowing some of the headaches that I'd be dealing with when operating in this environment. Next step was to start calibrating the sensor. So just like an actual compass, I have digital compasses on uh, the computer. And just like an actual compass, if you put a magnet towards the compass, it's actually going to point towards the compass and not towards north. So I had to use software to calibrate uh, the uh, magnetometer on my submarine uh, to, to, take, to compensate for the ferrous objects in, uh, inside of the, the hull itself. Uh, and so here you can see the blue one is, is the previous one. It's kind of shifted and scaled. And then what, with the new, after I ran the software and maneuvered the vehicle and recorded the data, that was the compensated values, which is the green values. So that's hard soft calibration. That's if you have ferrous materials, uh, things like that. Uh, but there's also what's called dynamic uh, issues, dynamic calibration. And that's where if you excite it, if you turn on a motor, that can create an electromagnetic field, which can influence the magnetometer too. So I said, okay, well, I got these thrusters that are really close to the hole. I need to create a test stand that will allow me to run my thrusters and make sure the sub's stationary and, and, and measure these deflections to the magnetometer. So I created this quick uh, two by four and tied it down, placed it in a tub, and I had to put it in the water to, to put it under load, uh, but ran at a, uh, ran a, created a script that would, would record the magnetometer values as I ran the thrusters through and then exported them as CSV files so I can analyze them. But here I'm running at full speed, uh, measuring the data, and uh, here's what one of the values looked like. So you can see uh, it starts in the center, and uh, as, as the thruster is, is forced forward, you can see the, the headings, the roll pitch yaw start to diverge, and then vice versa when we start at zero again, they're all sort of near, the, near zero uh, radians, it starts to diverge again. So okay, well I'll apply a polynomial to this, and then for each thruster I'll have a unique polynomial for three for the roll pitch yaw. Uh, for instance, if if it's negative 0.6 thrust, negative 60% thrust, then I need to subtract uh, 0.13 radians from the solution based off that. Problem is, is the more I ran this test, it was not linear. Every time it was different, slightly. And I said, boy, I'm spending a lot of time on this, writing these scripts, recording this, trying to get this. Is there an easier way to do it? Yes, I'll just move the thrusters away. And that's what I did. I moved it about 10 centimeters away from the magnetometer. Uh, and it, of all the submarines we've had in here, maybe with the exception of sub five, uh, None of the submarines have had this issue quite to the same extent because their thrusters have been farther away from their sensor. So you live and you learn. Uh, but about this time, so I had, I, had the I had the sensors calibrated. I had the computer set up. I had a watertight motors working. I said, all right, great, controller time. Let's put it in the water and test out my controller. Uh, and so we went out and you can tell by the look on Lucas's face that it did not go well. Uh, one of the issues was I did not have enough pitch authority. So the front, front thruster and the front right thruster and the back right thruster were just too close together. So I said, Okay, I need to get more thrusters on there. This can't be solved with ballasting. If I put more ballast on it to get the, the stern back up, it's not going to be able to sink. So I added four more thrusters, and this is the CAD model. The issue with this, though, is where if you remember, when I talked about my power communication port, there were only six outputs, and I sealed it in potting. 
So I can't add any more outputs to it. I want eight thrusters, I only have six outputs. So I had to create a bunch of uh, splitters, uh, big headache, added more cables. But I got to work, finally on there. Eight thrusters, ready to rock and roll. Let's get in the water, get it, get the controller tuned. And this was the first test. So it's a little, oscillates a little bit, uh, but uh, it, what it's doing right now is just holding its position, holding its depth. Now I can't keep it in its same position. I can control the depth, I can control the orientation, but I cannot ensure that it, it doesn't move forwards or left and right. The only reason why it's not doing that, at least visibly from our perspective, is because the tether is acting as an anchor. In later examples, you'll notice that I've uh, ballasted the tether so that it doesn't act as an anchor. Uh, but because I just don't have X and Y control right now, that is typically done with a DVL um, on professional AEDs. But you can see here, we're testing it um, and it's stabilizing from, from dead to powered up with the eight thrusters. And then at this point, Lucas is gonna give it a kick and showing it recovering and maintaining its depth too. So I really wanna iterate, I only have control at this point of the orientation, so roll pitch jaw and the depth. And uh, during testing, shortly after this, I started, uh, I plugged in the sub submarine once and I heard a pop. And, uh, and this wasn't the first time I heard a pop. These thrusters started going bad uh, and rapidly. So the, the, the people who designed these thrusters were mechanical engineers, not electrical engineers. And they were following some open source thruster. It just really didn't do well. I contacted the company to get more. They stopped selling them because they were not good. They knew they were not good. Uh, they gave me uh, three more models for free. However, uh, they said, that's it, that's all you got. And those helped me out for a couple more weeks before I decided I need to jump ship and completely redo, uh, overhaul my electrical system uh, in this manner. So this is what it looks like now. I have uh, a power splitter that goes now to eight outputs instead of six. And uh, I have, now I need to incorporate a microcontroller that can isolate each thruster. So each thruster is no longer uniquely addressable. I have to isolate them and send them to a PWM. Now also I had to add, uh, ESCs before they were right on the thruster. Now I can't do that anymore. So I have to have an uh, ESC now and I don't have any room in the watertight capsule to do that. So I have to store them all out outside, which means they have to be waterproof. So I got the thrusters here. You can notice there's no blue ring around the top anymore. And it's an aluminum trough. I 3D printed caps on it and then put in two cables, one for pulse width modulation and the other one for uh, power and then sealed it with thermally conductive epoxy. Uh, and so that would allow any heat from the ESC that would be discharged straight, straight into the water. Now, the problem with this uh, is that if the thruster breaks, so the motor somehow is damaged or the ESC breaks, uh, you just throw it away. There's, you can't recover this. This is, this is a, one, a disposable thruster. Uh, so this is only part of the problem. The other problem was, was getting the microcontroller that could put out the PWM signal. So this is actually a microcontroller inside of a rough uh, polyurethane. And this is play, taking the place of the communication uh, block, which goes on the bottom of the submarine like that. So great, okay. So I got submarine working, I think. It's the thrusters are working great. It'll, it doesn't leak anymore. Uh, and I, I was testing it one day, getting ready to go out in the water. And I noticed I had the vehicle facing north and I rotated 90 degrees to face toward west. And initially it did, but I was looking at the orientation of the computer and it started veering back towards north and settled back on north again, even though I didn't move this up. I rotated an additional 90 degrees to south and it rotated a little bit to the west and then headed back up north. Turns out I had a counterfeit bad hardware. I had bad magnetometer. Uh, I decided early on to buy the $15 cheaper uh, magnetometer from Amazon instead of buying it from a reputable distributor. And that cost me about a week's worth because I thought it was my software doing it. In the end, it ended up being that this magnetometer on the bottom here. Uh, and this, it's the same IC, you look at it, it's the same identical IC as that IC, but I think it's just a, a, a bum part. So I paid $15 more for a new one and, and it worked great. And uh, that led me to finally a platform that I could use to begin doing research. And so here, this is actually running missions. And you notice that it descended initially, that's because it was station holding at a higher depth than, it was, than I gave the mission. But all it's doing is it's open loop, driving forward for something like five seconds and then doing a 180. Uh, and then at one point it's gonna, the next one is uh, 90 degree turns here. Uh, you'll notice it's a little bit more than 90 degree turns because I hadn't calibrated the new thrusters in. Uh, but still, overall I was pretty happy. But you also notice that it's kind of starting to drift. You can see it's veering to the right there. Uh, and, and that's the effect I was talking about, how it's like an, a hockey puck on ice. I, I can control the depth, but I can't control its position. So it just kind of slides around. And in order to do that, what they use is the DVL. And this is the DVL in Subjugator 8 uses sound to track its velocity in the water. Uh, but the DVL is kind of big. It's, it's about as big as Englishfish itself, in, at least in length. Uh, and it's also $25,000. So DVL would never be used on, on Englishfish. So I had to come up with a workaround. 
And that's the second part of my dissertation. So here's a quick graph of, of kind of the navigation software. So on the left, I have my gyro magnetometer that's fused with a common filter. This gives me my orientation. So like a cell phone, when you go to portrait to, or, uh, to landscape, that's what that's doing right there. It tells you my magnetic head heading. But, and I have my pressure sensor, which gives me my depth, and that's fused uh, through this. But I don't have DVL track because I don't have a DVL. So this is what I need to replace, and that gives me my X and Y. So I have Z, roll, pitch, and yaw right now. I need to get X and Y. Uh, so the substitution of a DVL. So the first thing I said, well, what do I have already on my vessel that I could use to maybe assist with it? And I'd heard of people integrating accelerometers, double integrating accelerometers. But I read online, everybody said, no, you can't do it. It doesn't work since there's too noisy. And I said, but I'm different. I'm different. I'm going to make it work. Uh, and so, and one of the reasons I thought that was because we had a special, we got, we got a pretty nice accelerometer on this device uh, that, that is not typical for hobby grade. It's a step up. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to do an experiment. Uh, I'm going to write my code to double integrate the accelerometer. So you extract velocity from acceleration and then from, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, velocity from acceleration. Then you take, uh, uh, integrate velocity and get your position. Uh, and I placed my accelerometer on the table. I didn't move it at all. And I just recorded and ran the program for 60 seconds. And this is, this is what happened. Uh, so the orange line is the velocity over time, and you can see in 60 seconds, the computer said that my stable, my stationary uh, accelerometer moved by about six meters. So this was not feasible. I couldn't do this, so I had to have some sort of external tracking device. So I thought, well, I have a little bit of a background in OpenCV computer vision, so maybe I can install a camera or something on the boat that could look in the water and, and somehow track the vehicle. Uh, and this was the kind of idea. So that's, that's Navigator right there with downward-facing camera. If I put a really bright light, on anglerfish, this is a fishing lure, bright green fishing lure. Maybe I could track it, you know, get 10 feet underwater, which is great. You know, you wouldn't ever use this in the ocean, but for my proof of concept, we're, we're great. So I set up a quick test bench. We're in here actually in the lab where I set a camera above uh, above above anglerfish, and I kind of move around. Just a proof of concept. This is in a lab, and what it's showing is that that the computer can track the light when it's in frame. Uh, the lines there are just just kind of playing with it, showing showing that it would work. But it looked really good, so I said, "Okay, okay, well, let's let's put this in the light. Let's see what happens uh, when 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 the submarine's in the water and uh, and I have this tracking system going on." So everything was looking really great. Uh, I thought, "Well, this is definitely feasible. This is something I could do." I'm really happy with the results, and then it started getting towards the surface, and the computer started getting confused with sunlight. So this project suddenly turned a lot more difficult. Another thing I found was if the camera rotates just a little bit, it really throws off because I am assuming that the camera is stationary. It's oriented to north and it's rock solid. It's not rotating out, which is not true. In fact, in this video, we were using ropes to tie it to the pool. And so it was like moving on and there's somebody swimming in the water, it's moving all over the place. So I had to get another inertial measurement unit that would give me my roll pitch shot of the camera. So now I have an IMU on the camera, I have an IMU on the submarine, and those are both connected to my laptop. And that allows me to say, hey, if the camera rotates and you see the submarine here, you need to rotate the position of the submarine. And that seemed to work well. Uh, once I got those two on there, I could actually start tracking the submarine in good lighting. So this is, you'll notice, in the shade of the wall while it's testing. Uh, and as I move it left and right, you can see it kind of following. Uh, you'll notice one point I, I start rotating uh, the camera and the submarine kind of starts going wonky. And the reason for that is I made a mathematical error that I didn't know about at the time in my controller, uh, which is solved later. But happy with that. So I get the IME, I get tracking system, the light's really good, then this will work. So I said, well, how do I solve the light? The first thing I thought when I was suggested by Shannon, well, maybe I could get a optical bandpass filter. So it works just like an electrical bandpass filter, but instead of filtering out signals, you filter out light. So we got a diffraction grading uh, device and actually looked at the frequency of the LED. So these are, these are actually LEDs here. And you can see it's about 5.3, 5.4 gigahertz is the green light. So we get one of these fancy lenses and put it on the camera and filter out all light except for the green light if it's rated for 5.4 gigahertz. But I looked up the price on these things and just to get one that would be difficult to fit in the camera is like nine hundred or a thousand dollars. I said, okay, that's not that's not going to happen. And I thought, well, what if what if I blink the light in a way? So I, I get the camera so that it the frame rates are synced with the with the light, and then I say, okay, frame A should have the light on, frame B should have the light off, frame C should have the light on, frame, and that worked great. I had a sequence, but it would drift after about five minutes, and I was having the hardest time of getting them to be consistent. It's just really really challenging to get that light blinking at the same frame rate. So I said, all right. I'm spending a lot of time trying to solve this. Lake Wabert, I already knew visibility was very poor, so it's very unlikely that the sunlight was going to be radiating down that far. I'm very confident that the brightest thing in the water is going to be the light. 
and uh, from the sun rain and not from reflection off sunlight. So I said, let's, I need to start testing. Let's test at night. So start testing at night. This is a typical setup right at dusk, uh, going out where it had boom, getting a little bit more sophisticated, moved from, from strings and rope to PVC pipes and uh, had the camera looking down at that. And here's the initial one. So the first part of the video is, is taking over several minutes. It's sped up. You see it's oscillating a little bit, but overall it's not floating around like a hockey puck. It's staying in the same location. Then I started running missions and I started having some issues. I noticed, uh, and I had no way, it just, just observed from the surface, it seemed to move a lot farther than I told it to. Like if I told it to move one meter, it seemed like it moved one and a half meters in some directions. And then other directions it moved maybe 0.75 meters. So I, thought, eh. I calibrated it earlier with a checkerboard, which is uh, typical. Uh, process for doing that, but I just I don't think it, it worked well. So I actually came up with uh, with my own calibration method. This is in the office, and Matt, if you're ever wondering why, I think I explained this why there's tape in an office. Uh, so I placed blue tape and measured it very accurately, and then I went in and used the camera and placed on the camera red points where I saw the blue pieces of tape, and the black numbers represent the actual position. So this is the origin right here, zero zero. This is negative 0.5 meters to the left, negative one meters, and so on. So a series of these. And then what I did is said, okay, computer, what do you think these red dots are at? They should be close to these black numbers. And after I tuned, calibrated a little bit, I wrote in a uh, polynomial equation to, to linearize it. I got, and so you can see I got a uh, pretty close answer. The, the farthest off one was, was off by about 10 centimeters at that point. So I said, okay, I think this is gonna work. Let's make a test because every other test is just kind of eyeballing. Does that look like a meter? Does it look like two meters? I need an underwater ruler. So I came up with this idea of this test where it has three waypoints, waypoint two, waypoint three, and this will test my X movements and my Y movements. And how it works is the center of this is I'd start the vehicle and I tell it go two meters up. And however much it was offset by that center point, I could say, okay, it overshot it by this or left or right of it. It will work like that. This is what one of these signs looked like uh, where the, this is the center that's 10 meter, 10 centimeter radius, uh, 20 uh, centimeter radius, and that's 25. So Grid 25, 25 minute PVC, which it's denser than water, but not by much. And it's, we had issues that if you kick it, and these need, once they were down, they need to be really solid. So, and we kept kicking them, moving them around. It was a big headache. But this is how I envisioned the test to be run, where I'd have the camera in the center here, and then the three waypoints, and then anglerfish would maneuver left and right. But the problem is, it's like, okay, great. What do I, but how do I consistently record the position of the submersible? How do I do that? I mean, what do I, I'm out of the water, how do I measure that? And so I thought, well, what about in the Navy, we'd use these things called plumb bobs or sounding bobs where you can measure the depth of tanks. Uh, and I think, uh, I thought, well, well, something like that, but I can't really do that in the water when I move around. What if I use a laser pointer? And we mark the position of, of the laser pointer. So it's actually on anglerfish right here in the front. Uh, but we place a laser pointer on the submarine and then all we do is look at the reflection of the laser on the bottom of the signs. Uh, and this is what the setup looked like where we had three signs. There's waypoint two, waypoint three, and waypoint one. And we had the vehicle just moving between there. And here are the results of one of the first times we finally got this thing to work. And you can see it's kind of consistent. We used pennies, but it was off. It overshot by about five centimeters top left. So decent, uh, you know, something worth writing. And uh, at this point I started saying, okay, well let's, there's another lake day coming up. Let's see what this will look like. Maybe we can put this on, on the boat, see if it's worth it. So let's do a, a visibility test in Lake Lobber. So I had another student, Max, who helped me, and he built a, a rig here to, so with apertures. So you put a bright, super bright LED inside of here, and then we had this cross aperture, a wide aperture, and a narrow aperture. And the idea was that, oh, possibly if it's too wide, it would oversaturate the camera, but if it's too narrow, we won't be able to see it far enough. What if there's this crazy design, see what that does? Just kind of experimentation. Uh, and this is kind of what it looked like. And now we need to measure visibility. So we created a ruler where uh, each string represents 10 centimeters and at 50 centimeters we have a piece of tape, 100 centimeters, 150. And this is, the idea was that if I place the light here on this end, 10 centimeters from this, and I start a camera on this side and I'll slowly walk it, this is in the water, walk the camera towards the, uh, towards the camera, we can look at the footage later and then count the strings to see what the visibility. We're hoping for six feet to, to, to four and a half feet, that would get the submarine deep enough below the propellers that we don't have to worry about anglerfish getting chopped up by navigator. So here's the video. Uh, we we're really excited to see what the visibility looked like uh, once it goes in. So I'm moving the camera forward. You can barely make it out, but that's 150 centimeters right there in the bottom right hand corner. And I'm moving, you can see the strings here counting down. There's 100 centimeters and the light's right here. The light's right here. And just still can't see it yet. 
coming in. There's 50 centimeters, no visibility yet. And finally, there it is, popping up. So uh, approximately 35 to 40 centimeters visibility with a 1500 lumens light. At that point, I realized that a light tracking solution in Wet Lake Wobbert is never going to work and we're going to have to shift to acoustic base. And I'd avoided doing acoustic base the whole time because I felt like I could get these systems up and running a lot quicker. Uh, however, the environment proved that this would never be possible. So I started working on the acoustic system and I actually started on the transmitter. I, I, and how this works is it's instead of the camera tracking the submersal, so I have a camera and a light. Uh, what I'm going to do is put a pinger that would act as the light and the sonar, the passive sonar that acts as the camera. So it's doing the same thing, but instead of using light, it's using sound. Uh, so this is the first transmitter used. In this work, a student actually created this circuit. I just retrofitted it to work with my ceramics. Um, and it worked fine with some smaller piezoelectrics, but we weren't sure about the big one, but I wanted to try it anyways. Uh, so put it in a pot of material uh, and hooked it up to my actuator board. And this is what it looks like when it's mounted. The idea is that wherever the, it's attached to the angler fish so we can track it with a sonar. And it just was too weak. It was too weak. We were testing it and could barely pick up a signal at close range. So I said, oh, let's try. Let's try and get some real hardware that is meant to drive these things. Uh, so, and I decided to start, I'm going to build my own at this time. And I uh, started out with a Maxim chip that's used for ultrasounds uh, and uh, purchased some, some off-the-shelf uh, circuitry here and then added in a, a, a potentiometer with a, a voltage readout. And then I built this little circuit up here with a microcontroller that I could change the frequency. So we wanted to see how does frequency affect the size of the uh, ceramic and also uh, whether the, the rate of transmission matters. So we want to do 10 hertz, 5 hertz, 1 hertz, uh, see how that affects and, and what that does. And it worked great. It worked fantastic. We could see it across the whole pool. Really happy with the results, but it was too big. It was too big to put to pot the whole thing to put it on the summary. So I needed to downside it. So I created my own custom circuit board, boil it down to the bare components, and that's what this circuit board was with a microcontroller and the high voltage. It's all I needed to, to put it on the submarine. This is kind of what the finished product looked like. And uh, I put it in this, whoops, put it in this uh, box right here, and, uh, and it was going to work great. Now, however, when I started testing it, here's a screen of the previous one that I'd stated, the big one, that, that, that did not, that worked great. And you can see it goes from plus or minus 200 volts. This is the output. This is actually what's applied to the ceramic. And I looked at the one that was giving me issues. It was really weak for some reason. And the output of the small one I made was only going to positive 200. It wasn't actually going to negative. It was stuck there. So I looked at it, and there was a, what I suspect was a, a cold solder or a disjoint, uh, a disconnection on the output. So I was only getting one output instead of two outputs as a, in a push-pull configuration. Uh, and in my attempts to fix it, I destroyed the board. So you can see it's all melted here. And I destroyed the perf board, not the, not, um, which meant I had to uh, get a new one. And that could take several weeks. I had to order a new board. Uh, and in the meantime, I was like, look, I really need to make progress. Maybe I can make my own. So I decided to go with this other device that very simple. It just uses an IJB, uh, IGBT uh, transistor to drive high voltage, almost like an LED. Very crude, very simple, very inefficient. But it worked. Here's the output. So instead of going negative, I got rid of negative voltage. I just went zero to 400. So uh, the difference is the same, but the output was 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 just as good. Um, uh, at this point, I said, "All right, great. Well, I got. I'm still waiting on these circuit boards to come in. Let's make sure this thing works. It looks good on the paper on, on the test bench." So I went out to uh, a pool, uh, one of the local pools, and tested it. I wanted to compare it to industry grade devices. So on the left, I have a Teledyne pinger, which is a thousand dollar pinger, and I'm going to compare it to my gray pinger here, which is about fifty bucks. And then I have a Teledyne eight hundred dollar hydrophone compared to my forty dollar hydrophone. I want to see how they compare. So I'm going to do a head to head here. This is what the setup looked where I had the hydrophones on one end of the pool, as far away, and then the other end was the pinger, and the results. So on the left, I have the eight hundred dollar hydrophone that listens first to their product. So this is their both their products, and I got a, a max amplitude of twenty two point nine millivolts peak to peak. When I put my transmitter in with their hydrophone, we got 37.9. So my transmitter seemed to be a little bit more powerful. Now, when I use my hydrophone and their transmitter, it was actually more sensitive. So their, my, my hydrophone was more sensitive than theirs. And when I use my pinger, it totally blew the other one out of the water. And this makes sense because the, the surface area of the p pinger of the piezoelectric element was much bigger than, than the Teledyne version. And still, before the circuit board came in, I was still able to test this, get it all potted up, and put it on Englishfish. So now I have a submarine that works. I have a submarine that transmits. Let's start working on the passive side, the sonar side. So previous in our lab, we'd used 
these configurations, T-shaped with these hydrophones, each one of these are $800 a piece. Very, very expensive, uh, very difficult to work with. So I thought, well, maybe we can do the same thing if, if I do it much cheaper with, with some off-the-shelf things. And I'd read a paper by uh, Dr. Benson, who worked at UCSD, and she'd done an affordable acoustic modem using these STEMI uh, piezoelectric elements and putting cork in it and mounting it and then doing polyurethane. So I tried to mimic her uh, device with this. It turned out okay. The cork didn't seat quite as nicely as hers, and I added a mounting point to it. But overall, we we're kind of happy with it. Now, all previous tests I'd done with my hydrophones, I'd amplified it. So we have a $1,000 Velodyne super fancy uh, bandpass filter. But I wanted to build my own because I, we can't afford to buy four of these things. Uh, so I took the hydrophone right out to Lake Wahlberg and you know, just straight up to an O-scope and got these measurements to see what, what would you expect the maximum voltage of, of the pinger. So it started out at 16 millivolts, peak peak quickly dropped off as we moved the pinger way down to 10 volts, or sorry, 10 meters. Uh, so I said, okay, great, well, I'll configure my bandpass filter to accept a max voltage of 16 millivolts peak to peak. Uh, now I said, well, the other design I was not happy with, the cork base, took up a lot of space, used a lot of rubbers, really kind of big. So I instead uh, created the baffles. Instead of cork, I created baffles out of 3D printed material. And this actually acted as uh, uh, strain relief for the cable so it could yank on it. Uh, the other one didn't have this. If you yanked on it, you'd actually yank on the, the spool, on a 3D printed spool. Much, much smaller hydrophone. Uh, really happy with results until I started putting it in the water. And I noticed that some of them perform better than others. Uh, and I'd read online that when you're working with these materials, you can get often bubbles will interfere with sound. And I noticed there's a lot of bubbles, especially the ones that were had damping on it. So I thought, oh boy, I need to get rid of these bubbles. So I cut them all open, ripped out all the polyurethane, and then re-poured them. But this time I did it in a vacuum chamber. So I removed all the air and the, and the rubber and, uh, and, and repotted them and got about 50% improved sensitivity uh, voltage-wise. So really happy with that. So that's, that's where we're at with these. Um, this is the first array that I created. Um, it didn't do so well because the vertical beam here was, was just not rigid enough. It flexed a lot, and if these move much, it really drops the accuracy. So I 3D printed another big one and uh, found that this greatly, greatly caused interference with the receiving. I'll show you a graph showing the effects of what I believe this caused. The final solution was uh, a fiberglass rod centered above it instead of offset. Much smaller, more rigid, much happier. So here's the, the expensive bandpass filter we were using. Uh, the Veldyne product, and uh, you can see up here, I started to compare some of my own bandpass filters. In an effort to save time, I decided to build everything on a perf board. I used a calculator online. Everything looked good until I tested it on in the water uh, with uh, uh, Navigator. And the intention was this bandpass filter was supposed to cut out propeller sounds and only hear the pinger sound, but it actually amplified the propeller sound. Uh, so it was, it was really bad. Uh, so I said, okay, we're going to do this right. I'm going to build another circuit board and, and do this the right way. And that's where I came up with this. And per recommendation of Dr. Griffiths, we went with these uh, chips right here, which are easy bandpass filter. And it worked fantastic. It worked very, very well. Cut out the propeller sounds. Really allowed us to operate in the water with the boat running. Uh, and that's the finished product here where I have the bandpass filters mounted here. Here's an ATX power supply, another power supply for the bandpass filters. And this is the computer now. This device right here, this is my analog to digital converter. So it takes in the analog signals out of my bandpass filter and converts them to numbers. Before I started this project, I made this compromise. I said, look, of everything here, I have experience with some of these electrons. I think this is gonna be simpler, but the analog to digital conversion at the high rates that I need to test this, this is something I don't wanna spend time on. Is there a solution that I can buy? So this is a compromise. So for future projects, this is an area where you can greatly cut down this. And if you get rid of this, you don't need a computer either, because this is the only way I could do this was with a computer. So had a working box, working bandpass filter, went out and did a test at University of Florida pool. So here's Ken testing it. Here I have the passive sonar and we are placing the pinger at different varying distances. And the idea was to measure the accuracy of the sonar with a pinger in different positions around the sonar. So maybe there's a blind spot to the west uh, where any signals coming from the west or a blind spot to the east. I wanted to find that out. And, and I wanted to find out different distances. So here's the graph for the first time I went out of there. And this was the soup, this was with the big uh, vertical offset that I had included. Uh, the one that I said it was too big. You see just really terrible. So blue is good, green is bad, and red is super bad. So you can see not much blue here. I had a couple good ones, but just really not happy. When I removed and, and downsized to the fiberglass rod, it greatly improved the accuracy. However, I still had this red spot here. And after looking at the data, I was able, I had more time. Previously, I'd do all my testing at the lake, and it took multiple hours. I got smarter. 
and had some after some student suggestions uh, and uh, and actually recorded all the data and then analyzed the data later. And so this is before I was able to analyze the data. And once I was able to analyze the data, I was able to get a lot more accurate. So the overall accuracy, if you took all uh, 300 samples that I have in here, the average error was about 6.3% error. So plus or minus 6.3% error, which we were shooting for under 10% we felt would be adequate for, for uh, testing. That was the goal we were setting for. So since then, since this test, we placed it on Navigator and got out in the water and tested it. And previously it was just observed. The data was observed and we weren't doing anything with it. Now the vehicle is actually using our sonar to locate underwater pingers autonomously. So this is the first time it's actually been used. So where can we take this research next after all the work I've done? Well, the first thing is integrating the sonar with anglerfish. I was unable to do that uh, during my research. So that's an area that someone can uh, further this. Additionally, once that's done, then we can start integrating the two vehicles with, with subjugator and actually continue that. Now, if I had to redo this uh, project, one thing I would do was revisit the passive sonar. One of the headaches with, with the way I did my sonar with 100 millimeter spacing is it was very difficult to tell when the signal came in, especially with noisy signal. Here's a very clean signal coming in. You can see there's four colors, each representing one uh, of these separate hydrophones. And you can see very clearly that hydrophone B is the first one to hear. You can see the first spike right there before anyone else. And then maybe the cyan hydro hydrophone D maybe hears it next. Uh, if you zoom in, it's a lot more clear here. Uh, definitely B first, and it looks like cyan. So very, very easy for us to see when it starts. But as the, and this was at two meters. However, when the pingers move farther and farther away, it gets a lot harder. So here's, here's a pinger that was moved farther away. And you can see that this gets more challenging. Now, what you could do is say, hey, well, I'll just increase the threshold to uh, 50 millivolts, and we won't trigger it there. But the, the signals I found weren't linear. Sometimes some were more sensitive than the others. It just got a lot more complicated. Or sometimes you start having uh, waves like this, where you're not really sure where it starts. You know, does it start here? Does it start here? I'm not sure. And with my spacing, with them being so close, being off by one period is huge. That is really, really bad. Whereas if these hydrophones were spaced off by instead of 100 millimeters, maybe 100 meters, something like that, it worked fantastic because that difference in period is so insignificant. So that's what I do. So what I would do is, is go back and, and actually go with half wave. And so with, sorry, with half wavelength spacing. So putting the hydrophones very close to each other. And at that point, all you need to know is, has all four signals started? Have they started? If yes, then wait a period or two and then grab uh, a one window of the periods because they're all going to fit within one window as opposed to mine fits across four or five windows. That's how I do it. And I do something like this configuration right here where the four hydrophones. Now, I can't do this with my hydrophones because they're too big. They're bigger than a half wavelength. So we may have to pot them in a solid, solid rubber. Questions? 